I'm here with Jeffrey Howard, and uh, we're going to talk about the industry today. All right. uh, I know that y'all have done a lot of renovations at the Celebration Grounds. Why don't you tell the people something about, a little bit about that? Yeah, sounds great. Um, things, are, things are moving over there right now. Um, so we had some storm damage to some barns, some of the older barns, and so we have torn down uh, a couple of those barns. There will be three new barns uh, built in time for the celebration. I think in total it's 48 uh, stalls and 10 porches uh, that will be a part of that. It won't be additional stalls because we tore down uh, some of the barns that were damaged. So that's a really good uh, thing that we've got going on. Obviously the new gate, uh, the main gate, it'll be named after uh, my dad. Uh, so the David L. Howard gate there and uh, along with that gate right there some of the entryway uh, to the uh, Blue Ribbon Circle Club has is a part of that renovation right there so new fencing a new gate in and out of the uh, Blue Ribbon Circle into the arena uh, so some really nice things going on there um, we had a sinkhole in center ring in the outdoor arena uh, and so that has been repaired, but as a result of that, we had to re-turf uh, with a new type of Bermuda, the entire center ring mm -hmm. there. So there'll be new turf. Uh, and then also, uh, the state of Tennessee, uh, we received a grant, $150,000, towards the changeover in footing inside Calsonic and Champions Arena. That will not be changed for the celebration, uh, uh, in time for the celebration. Uh, and we'll always be able to go back to the surface that, that yeah. our walking horses prefer, but it will allow us to uh, attract different types of horse shows and more horse shows, and so that's kind of been a focus. So a lot going on, uh, and even a couple other things, Jerry, that I think by the time the celebration gets here, Warren will be able to announce uh, some uh, some other deals that will be happening on the showground. So yeah, a lot going on there. Well, I know it, it looks busy over there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another thing that, that has come up, um, of course, I, I watch inspections all the time, mm -hmm. and uh, not only you know I went to a show in Alabama and watched other DQPs perform inspections. The DQP process is, to me, is working pretty good. I yes. mean, if there's something wrong, they're going to find it, and I do know that show is getting more and more shows, uh, moving into Kentucky quite a bit, and the need for DQPs. And uh, I don't have to tell you, that's a thankless job. <laughs> uh, put some insight on that. So I think, uh, yeah, um, we have a couple of issues, if you want to call it there, from a staffing perspective, which I guess everybody watching this probably has staffing issues. Right. <laughs> you know, however, uh, one of the things is, is we are getting more shows, but we're getting more shows over a larger geographic area. So it involves travel for guys if we don't have them in those areas. So that's one challenge that we have is the travel uh, to get to those. Two is just simply the sheer number of shows versus DQPs that we have. Um, and then another issue that we have, and this is just something that I think the industry has to, to accept, but we need to adjust how we staff our shows is that they're so long and the sessions are very long and they're lasting you know six seven eight hours of horse show that's really hard for the same dqp to do that all night or the same group and then come back and do you know so for instance know. fourth of july so we'd love to be able to recruit additional dqps we need them uh it's probably a must that we get some but we'd like to get even more so that our guys aren't working maybe those consecutive right. days and sessions that are so long um you know, we've we've talked about that, and, and I think our DQPs are wanting us to uh, do something with regards to show management of shortening those and not having or having to pay double. It's really not about that. It's for us to be able to staff it a little different because these horse shows, they're trying to raise as much money as they can for the things that they are benefiting. You put on a show or help put on a show. You understand that. Oh, I, I know mean. exactly what that is, buddy. <laughs> so if you if you can get classes sponsored and you can have them, I mean, you know. It, it's just a, the nature of what we do. We're a one-night horse show breed if it's not the celebration. And, you know, I mean, that's that's who we are. That's what we do. I mean, so. Well, the length of shows is what, you know, last year when we did the horseplay show, mm -hmm. I did something and everybody said, well, it won't work, it won't work. And, and the truth is it worked like a top. Yeah. Uh, we only had one incident and that's where the, we had, two different classes going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the first class got in 
and they said that's the class and the gate guy was shutting the gate but th there was one entry in the second division and I and I said whoa wait a minute they got to get in well the the judge come over and said Jerry I can't let them in I said but it's the same class I said it's just it's a different class but it's the same mm -hmm. and we talked and he said well I said if anybody gets on you tell them I made you do it tell them yeah. anything because it, it beat having just one horse in a class but as far as tying it he did great Paul Robbins I mean yeah. he, he did a super job of tying it was no problem and I thought next year we'll cut down because they'll combine some of these one show combine two classes and, and to me that's a shortcut I definitely think it is, uh, and I think you're on to something there um, that we can do when you talk about ages of the horses, you know, right. people that want that three and under or two and three, and maybe you can have a two-year-old and a three-year-old class in, say, right. trail pleasure or whatever, and they're all in there together, and, the, you know, uh, and I know we're going to segue to this, but, I mean, the Futurity's doing the same thing at the yeah. celebration. I mean, there are two classes in one. I know. So. Um, and, and whereas we're only going to tie one set of people because it's a celebration, if the Futurity nominated horse, for instance, in that two and three year old country pleasure is third, but it's the first Futurity nominated, there will be a separate set of results created from there and they will be the winner of the Futurity, won the prize money, but also like for high points and everything else. So it is really two in one and I do think a trend that shows could go to now again it doesn't necessarily help you with the sponsorship of the you know having two classes right. sponsor versus one but i definitely think for session length and for you know show management gets those calls you don't have a 15 to an under mary and gelding you know and they want to add you could have them in there together and just tie it separately and it. but it's still one class for everybody to watch and from a timing perspective only takes the time i i think I definitely think you'll see more people start to do it. I hope so. We, we had the only thing I ever heard. They said, "Well, Jerry, you don't want seventeen-year-olds in there against eleven and under." But we do that now. We have seventeen and under. Little Allie Joe Jacobs will go in there against him, but she don't care. She'll go in there against you. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I told. I mean, you got it. The, yes. Yeah, I mean, they the, will. Answer, the long answer to that, uh, or short answer to that, is yes, they can show together. No, I mean, no big deal. You know, if if we end up with a problem of having. Uh, safety concerns issue that means we got enough to have more that's horse shows right. that's, right. <laughs> that's, that's it that's it in a nutshell the other thing i wanted to talk about which this is a topic I'm, i've had several phone calls about it and that's the past act okay. and uh, how it's progressing and and i've told people to i know you put out an article about it but i don't see it progressing too far in its current form but that still does not answer the question of the people out here, should I go buy this horse? Should I go buy that horse? And that seems to be a major concern. Definitely, and, and uh, <clears throat> I think so the facts of that are it, it, it passed out a subcommittee. It's, it's due to go to a full committee hearing. Um, we do believe that Republicans on the full committee uh, none of which are from the state of Tennessee, but you have Kentucky, Alabama, Georgia, Ohio, North Carolina, Republic, Texas. <clears throat> so the breeders are going to be sending out to their members to alert them to at least ask them to vote no of, uh, on that in the full committee um, hearing. So I, I'm with you. I don't think if you looked at uh, probability or likelihood <clears throat> that a past act in the current form, which is the only form, um, would pass in this Congress. I mean, you've got elections coming up. This time. They're going to be out of session a lot between now and the end right. of the year. And I think they have a lot to get done. And I'm not sure what priority this may or may not have, especially if those Republicans vote against it in the committee. So I think the past act from a legislative perspective is of lesser concern than the rulemaking. Right. And so the rulemaking, they have expressed their intent to publish a proposed rule in um, October. Um, I don't think there's any guarantee that that is in October. I think that's their intent. We know with the government, they don't always work well, as fast as, yeah, <laughs> as, fast as you And so there would be comment periods. Um, people can go back um, on probably your media or the report and, and search that and go look at how that went the last time. It's the same rulemaking process. Um, we don't know what is in the rule. 
uh, because it hasn't been shared publicly anywhere. Um, and so it first will have to go to OMB um, for their review. It has not gotten to them yet. Um, there is a time period of up to 90 days that they would have right. to review it uh, and then obviously see any changes that are needed to it. You know, we are prepared um, as well as we can be. We have retained counsel in case the rule is negative to us. A lot of people are assuming it will be. I think it's safe to say that we won't agree with it if it is in any way, shape, or form dealing with the removal of equipment, removal of HIOs, things that were in the first rule. Um, but I think it's premature for us to say too much about it until we know what's in it. But we're prepared. We have funding for, for our legal fees uh, should we need them. Um, but I think, it, like I said, just right now, speculating what may or may not be in it, that there is one big factor that will be different than the last time, and that is, Jerry, between the previous rule, which was 2000, I guess, 16, mm -hmm. um, is when that was all going through, um, and now was the National Academies of Science study. And so it, um, I think, depending upon how you read it, you could say whether it was good or bad or did it say inspections were okay or not. There is one clear thing in there that it said there's an issue with the SCAR rule. And so I can't imagine keeping the same inspection process or protocol um, given what was pointed out in a study funded by the government and the industry jointly, which right. is the first time in history, right? Mm -hmm. But I can't imagine that it, it, that it can ignore that. So, so we're just really waiting to see what's in it Mm -hmm. what's there but we are prepared that'll go through a process that's not going to affect uh, as it goes through that process our show season um, so you know I think the best thing that we can tell people and I know you talk to a lot of people um, about this industry and owners and trainers and is, is we've been down this road before right. this is nothing new and we are as prepared if not more prepared than we have I won't say ever been because I don't go back too far, but since 2000 and anything that has happened to us, this is the most prepared that we are. There are a lot of other things going on um, with some of the other um, cases in the industry of you know in enforcement actions against uh, individuals uh, that also potentially could dramatically change the enforcement. Um, you know, yeah. obviously the ALJs and are they right. you know. Uh, properly appointed and can they make the decisions that they've been making the judicial officer so there's a whole lot uh, in the works but nothing yet totally finalized so uh, I know that's a long answer uh, to your question but I, I think people just have to pay attention um, you'll be reporting on it we'll be reporting on it but at the current time there's really not a whole lot I mean there's a, a full committee hearing would be the next thing I think people would hear about that is about to happen. I think that would be the, and then in October or some time period at the end of the year, we'll see what's in the rule. There'll be a lot of reaction. There'll be times for people to make comments, right. you know, be it hearings and things of that nature. But again, we have our previous response that we spent a lot of money on uh, yeah. in our comments during that last comment period and, and everything. So we have a the, the parts of the rule that are the same that, you know, we right. do already have uh, some of that work done. but. Um, and people need to remember the importance of spending the money and having a, a firm help us at this point in time when there's, you would think, just make the comment. But everything has to be on record during the comment period for us to bring it up later. Right. You know, so that's why a lot of the work is done during the comment phase of the rule rather than if we don't like the final rule and, and end up having to pursue legal action to protect right. our industry. So. Well, I know that one, one thing that came up that was really, and, and I, I thought it was laughable, they said that they would uh, do away with the current DQP process and they would inspect all the horses. Uh, I don't see that ever happening. I, I don't either. Um, well, I don't see it happening effectively. I mean, obviously they tried that to start uh, right. and, and, and figured out that they needed help. You know, um, the DQP process isn't perfect, um, but no system will be. No, but it can't uh, be. And theirs won't be either. It's made more imperfect by the highly subjective nature of what inspections have to be. Um, and so I think 
that's why from an industry standpoint when we talk about it is our focus hasn't been on who's conducting the inspection our focus has been on what is the inspection because if it is more objective it, it, it takes less importance on who's conducting it also um, I think one of the things that the National Academies of Science study pointed out was the need for experienced equine right. veterinarians and equine uh, practitioners to be conducting the inspections. I think that would actually be easier for the industry to, well, or, or, a, or an HO type of system to do than the government, just from a cost perspective and location and being, you know. Yeah. So I, I, I know you feel the same way. Um, p people don't realize um, that the DQPs do a better job than they than they think, and and that's not. I just believe the, the, the DQPs you know, do great. Uh, they do, and and they are the the front line. I mean, mm -hmm. they're at every show, every horse. You know, the government can't be at every show. Uh, you know, all of that, those types of things. And so, um, but you know, even think back, Jerry, from the formation of show and the thought of going to one HIO and all that. Really and truly, again, instead of talking about one HIO. Really, it should be one standard of inspection, and again, the more objective it gets, it doesn't matter because hey, we're all going to get into this. We need local because of the travel to these shows. So a show in Mississippi and a show in East Tennessee. I mean, it's hard to get the same people doing that. So I, I, I do think um, I think I think the focus ought to be that we be inspected very similarly with similar methods to the breeds that are governed by the United States Equestrian Federation. I think that is. Uh, a logical uh, solution. Solution, and, and that doesn't mean that a horse can't be checked for uh, being, you know, whatever we call fit to show length, whatever. That doesn't mean that they're sore by the act, right? right. I mean, that it doesn't that, mean that. It doesn't. It just means maybe, so. So there can be a front line inspection, but again, um, I, I truly believe that we should be moving more towards the technologies that are utilized by other breeds and how they're inspected. Well, there's one point I'm going to make. And that was back, and I think it was 216. I may be wrong. We brought in independent veterinarians outside this industry, three of them. Mm -hmm. I still remember what they said when I talked with them. This is not what we inspect. Uh, in, that's this is not what we expected to see. In other words, they were told one thing, and when they looked at our horse, they realized that what they were told was not what our horse was. 100% agree, Jerry. I've probably uh, taken to inspection, been around, hosted 50 people from independent veterinarians to other breed participants to United States Equestrian Federation type people that serve with them. Every one of them that comes to, usually it's a celebration, but comes to a show and sees inspection. They never come away and tell me that the DQPs don't know what they're doing. They never tell me that, and they're usually there to sit. They don't say that the government people don't know what they're doing. They don't say either. Though. What they say is that right there, that process, isn't telling you what it doesn't you work. To. You know what you need to know. Like that is not like that would be very hard for any other breed to stand up to. And and the other thing I always tell people is invite anybody to a walking horse show because. We've done it. We've seen it. I see the look on people when they get there. They're very questionable. They've heard all this stuff. They've heard these horror stories. They all leave with a better impression of our industry and our horse they than realize. when they got there. Every, that doesn't mean they think it's perfect. I'm mm -hmm. not saying no. that. But they always leave with a better impression than the we one they came with that was uninformed. Right. Um, and so anything we can do. So I tell people this all the time. Don't keep anybody away. Don't be ashamed of Open anything. Open the door. We, open the door. Let them come. I promise you they will not leave thinking anything worse than what they th thought coming in from looking online or hearing what they hear around. So I, I, uh, I would encourage everybody, it's an open door. Let them see. We let have them nothing. See yeah. I'll tell yeah. you, one barn here in town, Jerry Williams, you go out there, you will see different breeds of horses. Mm -hmm. One lady takes care of her quarter horses out there. And she watches them train. She watches them get ready. She watches everything. Yeah. She said, "This is amazing." She said, "All the stories I've heard. This is not what I've heard." And she watches Jerry cooks bacon to get grease to work the horses in. Yeah. I mean, use bacon grease. 
and because it's good for the horse, it's good yeah. for the skin. But it, she was amazed, and she was amazed at the way the horse's gait would change with the weight. She says, I ain't believing this. So if you don't believe it, just come to a barn and take That's a right. look. That's right. I, I definitely agree with that. I mean, it's, it's just, you said that right on the front end. That what they think coming in and what they'll leave thinking will be two different things, two and it'll always things. be better when they leave. Uh, and, and whether they think it's great or perfect, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it will be better than their impression coming in. That's it. Before we close up, uh, I do want to bring it up that uh, I had talked with Warren and, uh, and Connie about the national anthem. And I got some buddies of mine, which is the Flat River Band. And uh, they are going to do the national anthem the first Saturday night, but they are also going to play two hours before. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably on a flatbed, but I just hope everybody comes out and listens. These guys are, are really great. And Chad, I've invited him and his family came down before for the celebration. They loved it. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, he started buying walking horses <laughs> for his kids to ride on the farm. But uh, that's something that, that man. One, thank you for for getting that done. Um, absolutely, I, I think one of the things we all used to remember was being on the showgrounds prior to the start of the show. That's it. I remember going to wanting to see the horse that was competing for this or for yeah. that, and getting hats and t-shirts, whatever. Mm -hmm. So anything that we do um, to be able to bring that type of a festive atmosphere, people from our community, surrounding communities. Mm -hmm that we can get them to our show to maybe see the Flat River Band or anything like that is a huge positive for us. I, I do think it'll be well attended. Uh, we, we've had something similar in the past and it was well attended right oh, yeah. there. I, I do think that area where you're talking about doing it will be part of the renovations that have been done to that mm -hmm. gate and to the entrance to, to the arena. So man, that could be a really great atmosphere um, and for people to get to enjoy and then see horse show afterwards. Oh yeah, well the last time I remember they just funneled right on in to watch the horse show. That's right. So That's right. I'm looking forward to it. I know Chad and them are looking forward to it. They're, they're gonna do some uh, uh, short clips that we're gonna play leading yeah. up to it to get more people interested. But I am looking forward to it. Yeah, I think that'll be a, a, a big addition and, and again, thanks for doing mm -hmm. that. Well, we got it done. Jeffrey, I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you very and looking much. Looking forward to it.